Cabot Show with New York Times Women's Editor Charlotte Curtis, Henry Fonda, Harvard Law School student Harold Prince, Isaac Stern and Bob Rosengarten and the orchestra. The Dick Cabot Show is brought to you by Volt, the toothpaste with a fresh taste that makes your whole mouth feel alive and tingly. Ladies and gentlemen, Dick Cabot. a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heavens of invention. Or failing that, a hostess Twinkie. <laughs> That's about as dumb a thing as anyone has ever opened a show with. Do you like hostess Twinkies? I love them. I, yeah, love them. I, th I thought that would be funny. See the quick, quick contrast from Shakespeare to hostess Twinkies? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the show, is it? How are you? Feet wet? It's really something. This town is ridiculous. Uh, I, I am so glad, by the way, that this is the second night of the show. I must tell you that. You know, last night was a little bit of pressure because it was opening night, and it, I'm glad to have a typical audience back. Um, last night, well, I don't know if, you, if that's offensive to think of yourselves as typical, but I mean, like last night, opening night, we had a lot of important people here. This whole section was ABC executives, vice presidents, and when they shot the picture of the audience, you could probably tell them they were very conservatively dressed and very short haircuts. They have briefcases and they were the ones waving and making silly faces at the camera. <laughs> there was a party after the show, as you know, Robert. We were taken to the uh, Four Seasons restaurant. If you're from out of town, you might enjoy that. It's uh, quite a fancy restaurant. And they change the decor with every season of the year. That's why they get the name. Uh, right now they have a gray carpet with slush on it. <laughs> and a taxi comes through and splashes your pants every so often. It's just a bit of New York. I don't dig parties, I really don't. I, I've mentioned this before, I think. My idea of fun at a party is to sit in the corner and watch the avocado dip turn black. I, I'm not a fun guy. Say, I must say this, our crew did a miraculous job last night. We did last night's show, first show, without a technical run through or anything, and nothing fell down, and the crew gets very little recognition. Could you give them a hand? Yes, just, here, here. They'll be wanting money now. <laughs> no, but they don't get much recognition, only when they're caught on camera. And uh, it's a very, you know, long time between those things. Dick, I'd like to thank the band for the same reason. What? Well, last night we had very little rehearsal and everybody right. was used their radar. Yeah, there were only night. about eight clunkers. Oh, there were none. <laughs> there were none. Yes, the, the band is very good. Thank you. None of them... Uh... Say thank you, band. Thank you, band. Is that no? <laughs> That's nauseating, isn't it? I have this car that drives me here now. It's a chauffeur, and I feel a little fancy that way that ABC provided it. Uh, the chauffeur's a little odd, uh, unusual man. Abe is his name, and uh, today I, we almost ran into something. I said, keep your mind, he was talking to me, you know, and I said, keep your mind on your driving. And, uh, he said, I don't need my mind to talk to you. And I uh, <laughs> thought that was nice. I'm just folks, though. I can prove that by showing you that I have lost my tie clip. And this is an actual paper clip. Or, no. Is that something ladies use on their hair? Well, it's a ladies hair paper clip, then. Hey, it's very nice. I recommend them. I had a cab driver one time who stopped right in the middle of driving, and he said uh, he was sorry, and he had to let me out there, but he had to go to his grandmother's funeral. Did I ever tell this? And I said, when did she die? And he said, in 53, but I've been busy. <laughs> Can't imagine why I've saved that for so long. Say, did you see in the paper, I have some more time to kill out here, uh, that um, the Nixons are looking for a maid, it was in today's paper, and they're having trouble finding one. It's not the pleasantest job in the world because it's an enormous house, you know? And uh, they are looking for a maid. I just thought I would pass that tip on to anyone here. Uh, they really need it right now because Mr. Agnew's been gone a long time and the dust's piling up. And, uh, <laughs> But it's, um, oh, please. 
He was booed in Manila. Did you see that? His, actually, his speech got off to, on a bad start, I thought. He told the people of Manila that they should be very proud of their envelopes. And, uh... <laughs> Did you go to the opera opening last night? I was here. Oh, yeah, but you could have gotten there. Well, no, you could I went to the have. party. No, I think I had a good time. Yeah. Yes, you look a little tanner this morning. <laughs> I, I wanted to go to the opera. I've never been to an opera opening, and um, I couldn't go. My cape didn't come back from the cleaners. Actually, it did come back, but I had forgotten to take the milk duds out of the pocket. <laughs> it's really a mess. Why do I stand out here using your time when we have backstage Charlotte Curtis from The Times and Henry Fonda and a gentleman named Harold Krentz, who's um, an interesting... He, he is uh, an actual person who is represented on Broadway in a play. That intrigue you? Stay tuned. And Mr. Isaac Stern, one of the great musicians, uh, probably the best we've ever had on. Well, I don't want to offend anyone here. Uh, we'll be back after this message. Oh, yes, I know when I'm on the air. Yes, don't yell at me like that. I would like you to meet a, one of the most distinguished guests I guess we've ever had uh, on the show, a, a gentleman who, uh, you often use the word great artist when you're introducing a guest, and it's an overworked phrase, certainly. But in this case, uh, this gentleman is probably one of the finest artists this country has produced in the field of music, and a gentleman I'm told that it's uh, a pleasure to know, and I would like you to uh, see him, and we both will know him better. Mr. Isaac Stern, thank you. Is it? Thank you. Okay. And I want to thank you for something else. All right. Regardless of um, associations, I was asked to come here for my beautiful self and not to play the fiddle. Isn't and it? And that I really thank you for. That's funny. I was invited I don't know here. that they will, but... <laughs> <laughs> that's nice of you to come. Uh, I'm really grateful. You, yourself is just as good as your fiddle in my book. Well, that's very nice. <laughs> uh, it's funny to see you on, on the ground. I have a feeling you spent half of your life uh, in the air. Where I was reading about the number of concerts you do. A fiddler on the hoof. Yes. Practically. <laughs> fiddler on the hoof, eh? <laughs> Would you like a it's blue the blanket? It's <laughs> I may need one before. I, I, I know that an awful lot of people are going to be trying to get well, that away see, from I'm, you. I'm but... unfortunately living up, I'm afraid, to a very bad apocryphal remark that I'm told has been going around. I might as well say it myself. Sure. If somebody else does about the two men going on 57th Street, and one says to the other, Oh, you know, I heard Isaac Stern last night. And the second one says, Well, really? What did he say? Oh. You... It was not I who said that. Uh, <laughs> Can you, I often wondered, uh, when you see an actor or something, mo more of us can judge good acting than we can good music. Can, a, can an audience tell if they're seeing you play if you're in top form? Um, oh, very much so. Can they? Yeah, they, um, they have an instinct, very, very, very clear one. There's a sense of excitement, you know, you can, um, a performer on the stage has to have contact. As I'm sitting here, there are two different kinds of contact. One is the camera and the other is the public. Um, with the public, as you speak, you have to not go to them. You have to bring them to you. Mm -hmm. And then in a few seconds, you can tell whether they are with you or not. And if they're not, regardless of what artists may think of public much of the time, mm -hmm. chances are eight times out of ten it's your fault, not theirs. You mm -hmm. have to bring them to you. You have to have enough certainty, enough... Um, belief in your craft and its beauty and its magic mm -hmm. and you have to convey it and they have to come to you and enjoy it and, and you can tell whether they're with you or not and when they are that is that's the that's what the whole thing is about yeah. that's why you play music that's why you're a musician it's a little different from this television camera which is well, it's like an x-ray machine it's amazing mm -hmm. how how honest that that lens is and how it can tell what kind of a person you are yeah, it can or in not. a lot of cases. There are uh, some phonies that we all know who have survived for years, <laughs> though, in front of it. Um, I don't want to mention any names because some of them are my best friends. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> is, is serious music uh, um, something just for a, a few people? Uh, is it really an elite uh, 
who appreciate serious music, or is there any reason why it should be that way? Music on the whole is something that everybody can enjoy and is yeah. part, or should be a part, really, of everybody's life. <clears throat> I wish it were really more of um, the life of our time and our country. I feel that our education hasn't been what it could be, that, that, that the music, um, the arts in general, should be mar part of the everyday fabric of living a civilized life in the greatest nation on earth. You know, I, I know this country very well. I love it very much. And I wish that it would live up to its potential. Yeah. You know, I have the kids, uh, there's a lot of screaming about the times and about the troubles and young people. They have certain points. I don't agree with their methods in many, many times. I don't agree with some of the sounds they make. I think they're pretty loud and pretty strong. And I, I think if one cuts down the decibel level, it becomes rather a murmur of not so very important murmur at times. But they do say one thing that I think is true, that everybody wants to be recognized, wants to be a person, not a figure in a, in a mechanical society. And I would wish that our education would take the arts, all of them, music, dance, theater, architecture, painting, and make it part of the everyday life and language, that it's not something that one acquires as, a, as, a, as an ornament to living, but as a necessary part of living, that this is what civilization is all about, and this is what the United States can be and should be to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Good. Which is your That's important good. hand? Both of them. I've, I've never known with a, with a violinist. If one hand were to be caught in an elevator door, which one would you rather? Don't oh, not a nice thing to say. Uh, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> um, well, in that case, a joint might as just well be, be, be both of them. Mm -hmm. um, each of them has, um, they each have a, have a role to play. Um, if I had a fiddle, I... Oh, and you didn't bring yours. As well, a matter of fact, uh, I, this is a terrible time, thing to have done, but we sent someone back to the apartment for it. Um, or at least uh, it's supposed to be. Could, I was not supposed show... to play. No, you're not. But if you look behind you, you'll be amazed to find something resembling your fiddle. And I was playing with it earlier, a turkey in the straw and a couple of things. Um, hope I didn't scratch it or anything. Aren't we devils? Who used to say that? Oh, I think I know. Gee, it's beautiful. It lives better than I do. Well, it's a bit more right. Yes. It was, it's, it's, was made in 1737, so it's lived a little bit. Wow. It's a Guarneri. Now, you asked about which is the most important one. Yes. Uh, for some reason, I'd always thought the they left They do different hand. things. You know, I'm not going to play. But as long as this is here... <laughs> yes. Um, let's take a look at what a fiddle can do and what, what music can do, just for a minute, without being uh, heavy about it. Okay. You know, you hear kids starting to play, and they start to take their lessons, and they go, uh... you know, this comes out. And you wonder why the bother, and why the trouble, and how does that translate into music? And slowly they learn to straighten the bow out, and... And then they learn to maybe do something with the left hand to have a vibrato, so it begins to sing a little bit. But then the right hand has to do certain things. It has to make a sound. So each hand goes and does, has a very important function. And the main part of it all is to be very natural about it. Not this, not that. Just pick up the fiddle naturally and play quietly. Because a fiddle can dance. Or it can be very sad. Or it can be quiet and very reflective.
Can you imagine how good that would have sounded if you'd actually played it? <laughs> Thank you for letting us cheat you into that. We'll be back after this. Gee, that was great. Uh, Mr. Stern, why, why should people uh, spend the money that it takes to go to, say, to Carnegie Hall or somewhere if uh, they can actually get you at home on record and recording is so good these days? I, recording is never the real thing. Did you ever try to make love on the telephone? Uh, it's not the no, same but thing. I, I, was, I was told you shouldn't knock it till you've tried it. <laughs> uh, uh, no, well, I, I would say that I have it's not. A, it's not the same thing. It's, it's mm -hmm. you, it, the personal quality has to be there, that sense of excitement. This last weekend at Carnegie Hall, for example, I'm sorry that the whole country couldn't have been there because they'd, they've seen something that happens rarely today, too rarely. They've seen a bunch of kids, 47 yeah. of them, conducted by Alexander Schneider, great musician, average age 17 and a half, from all over, Indiana, university, schools here in New York, upstate New York, various conservatories, local high schools, rehearsing together for five days and playing music with such abandon and such joy that the audience came and filled the hall and they were delirious with happiness. They were at a real happening, you know? You hear a lot about happenings today. Mm -hmm. And those of us in music feel very strongly that a real happening comes from a disciplined background. That a real happening, the only freedom is when you have a discipline. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can be free. You have a discipline and then you let yourself go. Then you have a happening. And a happening can only happen at a concert. You need the audience. I need them out there. And I thought it was very appropriate in a way. I saw your show last night and mm -hmm. loved much of it, especially Beverly Sills is an yes, old friend and a wonderful artist. Yeah. And um, I thought it was very appropriate that there was one commercial, I don't know whether the whole country had it, but at, in one break just during your talking with Beverly, it was a commercial for ham. Mm -hmm. I, th <laughs> I thought that that was... <laughs> I didn't notice that. You can't see those here. I would have had well, a thing to say about it, like you know, there's a commercial for ham or something you like have that. To, you have to be ham. in the same sense that uh, any performer is on in television or the mm -hmm. theater. Great actor Henry Fonda today. Um, they're, they're there because they have something to say, because they attract people. Because you look at the people out there and say, now sit down and listen to something. Mm -hmm. But listen. One of, the, one of the most unhappy things can be, sometimes it can happen, you know, when the husband is taken along to a concert, you know, you finish the first one, like this, and you're full of drama, yeah. and right in the first row in front of you is, is a husband. <sighs> you're like, and he paid for that, There is nothing too. more disheartening than that, yeah. you know, you wonder why. There are things that happen like that once in a while. Yes, uh, it happened several minutes ago while I was standing here alone in the center <laughs> of the stage. Uh, I was reading about um, Paganini, who I suppose is considered the greatest violinist of, of past history, and uh, it's a shame there are no recordings of his playing because it said that, I think they said Schubert left his concert in a trance one night. And, uh, and it said that he can do something that you also can do, which was to play after the strings have gone out of tune as they will during a, during <laughs> yeah, a performance, will. and that through some incredible ingenuity you're able to compensate for that while playing. How is this possible, or is it a lie? No, it isn't a lie. In the first, <laughs> well, uh, the, it's, it's a charming story, it's slightly inaccurate. Yeah. The uh, actual fact is that they didn't play in tune at that time. Ah, <laughs> they, they, they didn't see. consider it. What is true is that he broke the string. They had different strings. The strings were much shorter and mm -hmm. made of gut, pure gut, very badly made at that time. Yeah. We have them wound today with, uh, with metal, with silver or aluminum, as the case may be, with a gut center. But it was shorter, and they could be easily cut or get frayed. And the story goes, probably true, that he broke three strings and mm. continued to play on the fourth, the G string, the most difficult one. And made it do the work of all And made it do the work of all four. Mm. It is a 
peculiar, if interesting, coincidence that he happened to have written a composition for that fourth string, and that the other three strings could easily be cut during a performance at that time if you brought the bow sharply down on the string, thus cutting it and leaving you with only one string, thus creating the effect of a broken string. I only mention that this is a, a curious coincidence, you see. But uh, that well, added to the story of the time. Tear up your pinups of Paganini, <laughs> folks. <laughs> but he was, he was a genius because yeah. what he wrote at the time in relationship to the violin playing that was at, at the level of violin playing at that time, mm. it, well, only a genius could have done it. Yeah. I'd hum it for mind. you, but we have a break for just a moment. Uh, oh, no, we don't yet. We have only about 30 seconds left to go. Um, but uh, that, that's amazing. Uh, there, there, I'm, am I correct? There is no recording of Paganini? There is none. No, when did there. recording come in just after that? Oh, <laughs> quite, a, quite, a, quite a good deal after that. Who was the, uh, last, who was the first great The violinist? first great violinist to have been recorded. Well, I, public, there are some recordings by Sarasate mm -hmm. and uh, Izai in the very early 1900s. You must excuse us and the station. We'll be right back. Henry Fonda will be here shortly. Uh, Mr. Stern, are you flying off somewhere? Uh, sh where will you be next? What part of America? Oh, I'm flying off the uh, day after tomorrow for one night in Paris and then for a month in Israel. Well, oh, that part of America. There. That part. <laughs> <laughs> are, there a, uh, are there any places you won't play? Yes, there are some places that I do not play in for personal reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. Germany, Austria, South Africa. Uh -huh. the, I do not... Um, make a big stand and a loud noise about it. I just uh -huh. don't join in. It's yeah. a very personal thing with me. Uh, music is a very personal affair with me. When I play for an audience, I have to feel a closeness. Mm -hmm. And um, it would be difficult for me under certain circumstances. I see. In those places. Right. I won't press you on that. I think they're self-evident. Uh, I would like to introduce a, a gentleman now that it, I, I like to see um, any boy from Nebraska make it, and a uh, blue-eyed boy from Nebraska who, has, who made it some years before I did is my next guest. He um, has acted with such skill and grace uh, and on the stage and on the screen for so many years that he's one of those people in the movies uh, who is part of our life or part of our lives. Um, would you welcome one of the big ones, a great star, Mr. Henry Fonda. <laughs> You looked so different in Easy Rider. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. No, that's <laughs> Do you remember Grand Island at all? No, I was six months old when my family moved back to Omaha. Can you remember anything, like uh, railroad no. tracks? Or well, I've like been that? back since. I went back there a couple of years ago. They've, yeah. uh, did you have a note to remind me about? No, no, I, I made that up out of they my own head. Up, there is no place called Grand Island. They I just picked made up that. the home that I was born in and have moved it to a museum outside Grand Island. You're it's cold. true. And I was, That's sad. And I was back a, a couple of years ago. It's the first time I've been in Grand Island since, well, yeah. 65 years ago. It's Grand Island, Nebraska, for those of you taking notes. <laughs> uh, we both lived there, but yeah. not at the same time. You know, that's funny that you should mention that about your home being gone. I went back to see my old block that I, about <laughs> two years ago. I had never been back in about uh, so 18 years or so. And there's a Safeway store there. <laughs> And, you know, that's an awful feeling to have your past blotted out like that. I have nothing against Safeway, but there's room for a plaque on the front of the store or something, I think. <laughs> but there's just, there's just nothing there. And then you, were, then you were in Omaha for a long time. Uh, until I, well, at, even after college, until uh, I came to New York in 1928 first. Yeah. And I've only been back to visit since. Uh, I, let me get this out of the way right away because it's a boring question to ask a film actor, but if you wanted to put one film in the time capsule uh, of all of the films you've done, um, do you know which one it would be? Or is it easy to narrow I've never it down? Been, to one no, choice? it isn't that easy, and I haven't yeah. been asked that question. You know, that's, that's very important. But I think maybe 12 Angry Men because I'm proud of it on more than one level. Except, you know, the other was I was an actor. I produced 12 Angry Men, and like Peter produced Easy Rider. It's the only yeah. one I ever did. 
and I'm proud of it, so as a producer as well as an actor, and uh, it won awards around the world, and I guess that would be the one to put in the time capsule. Not the moon is our home. <laughs> I read a, a list of your the... films, and The Moon is Our Home was in there. Now, I don't know how I missed that. When, what, what was The Moon is Our Home? It was a comedy Did with you... Margaret Sullivan, yes. It was a very good comedy, too. Was it was it... very successful, yeah. See, I, I was looking in a current biography of 1948, I believe. We, we don't have the most up-to-date library in our office, so that's why I happen to think of The Moon is Our Home. Um, I was going to ask you something that I, uh, I... Oh, The Moon is Our Home is one of the things I was going to ask you about. And Do you fish? Yes. No, I don't know why I thought of that. I think of you as a fisherman. I don't know if I've read that anywhere or... Uh, you could have read it. Uh, yeah. Not a lot. I do fish. I, I like to... I'm deep sea fisherman. Do you, go after, you don't go after the stripers? Uh, or you, I have, because we yeah. lived in Long Island one summer, two summers, when I was commuting to the theater, and I took a place out there so the children could have a place to have a summer, and mm -hmm. I'd take Peter's striped bass fishing when I come back from the theater at night, at midnight. That's when it's best, and the moon's right. Can you explain to me wh how the fish can see the bait at night? It's the moon. It's a certain, when the moon is uh, in a certain height and fullness, uh, the tides yeah. and the moons, when they combine, I'm not sure, there, there are tables, that you, yeah. the salooner tables yeah, that you can... There's phosphorescence in the yeah. water with a bait. With a, That's with true, a bait. too. Yeah. Is that, but don't you see people fishing on moonless nights? <clears throat> or not? I haven't. You, they're crazy people, but they <laughs> do it. I, I've often wondered, I worry about things like that, like how the fish are going to see the bait at night. Could you teach someone to act? Can you remember when you went from not knowing quite how to act to knowing how to act? It's a weird question. I can question. remember, but I don't know, think I can teach it. Did anyone uh, teach you? Was there a breakthrough where you suddenly knew how to do it, how to seem natural, realistic, convincing on the stage? It happened so gradually that I'm not sure there was a moment when yeah. I know that there was a uh, I got pushed into it. You see, I didn't have the ambition, and uh, Marlon Brando's mother, Marlon wasn't born then, was very active in the little theater there, and she really, mm -hmm. literally pushed me on the first time, and uh, kicking and screaming, because I didn't want any part of it. Yeah. But, and I gradually uh, discovered that it was like therapy, that I didn't have to be nervous, because it wasn't me. I was somebody whose lines had been written, a, a character, mm -hmm. a, conceived by a playwright. It wasn't, I wasn't that aware to be uh, articulated about it at the moment, but it yeah. was, I was learning that. And then the second time I did something was Merton of the Movies, and I believed I was Merton, I guess, because I remember I did it the same part about four or five years later, mm -hmm. and I, by the meantime, I had learned technique without realizing it. And I couldn't recapture the real feeling I had the first time I did Merton the Movies when the hackles were really rising and you really got short of breath and things because you were supposed to. Uh, and that didn't happen to me the second time. I know that I was much better the second time because I had learned a technique. See, but it was, what happens see, in those things is what you, what you really learn is what not to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the beginning of technique, to learn what not to do. The rest yeah. sort of builds up naturally after a time. Which was more pleasant for you, the one when you really thought you were Merton or the later one where you realized you were more in I control? I think maybe the first. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking yeah. really going back 45 years, but today uh, it's being in control. That's certainly... Uh, a good feeling to know that you're in control of, uh, yeah. of a character that isn't you, yeah. that Thornton Wilder wrote or John Steinbeck wrote or whoever. Do you envy any other professions? Ever wish you were in anything else? Well, I paint, Dick, and not professionally, but uh, for pleasure. Yeah. And I would be, I could be completely happy if I didn't have to do anything else. If I could paint? Make, yeah. Really? And I do it all day long. It's the minute I can get light, and I, I quit when I lose the light. And uh, I do it all day long. You know. yeah. So you were sensational in our town. Oh! <laughs> How rude. A man's holding up a yeah. sign saying, when buying a canned ham. <laughs> We've got to stop doing this with our actor friends. When buying a canned ham, remember the honest ham, armor, golden star ham. No offense to anyone. Talking with Isaac Stern and Henry Fonda. Um, you know, I was thinking uh, when Mr. Stern was saying earlier about the importance of the audience being out there and all, um, the, I saw you in our town last week. You were sensational in that. I wish everybody could have seen it. I'm sorry it's a limited run. And in the end of it, there was hardly a dry 
eye in the, in the theater and you could hear people snuffling and sobbing. Uh, does that affect you on stage? Can that make you better or is it distracting? Or? No, no. In our town is a, is a special uh, point. The actors must not be sentimental in our town. Mm -hmm. Let the audience, if they're going to cry, if there's going to be any crying done, let them do it. Yeah. Uh, and it's not easy. There have been, I'm told, stage managers, and that's the part that I play, who cried all the way through the play. I mean, they, they read their lines streaming tears, yeah. uh, which is all wrong. It kind of uh, doesn't leave the audience anything to do. <laughs> yeah. No, but the, it's not only Thornton Wilder's philosophy and uh, reasons for writing it, but also it's the New England, it's the, it's the New Hampshire uh, character, yeah. not to show emotion. And of course, they're all Grover's Corners, New Hampshire's. Where we're all from. Yeah. Is that a play you'd always wanted to do? I assume you didn't have to audition for the part. Uh, no, I didn't audition. <laughs> do you know, I have to confess, I hadn't seen it 31 years ago or subsequently in any mm -hmm. of the early productions. I didn't see the movie. When Martha Scott, who was the original Emily, uh, started the formulation of Plumstead Playhouse and wanted to do Our Town for the first production and asked me I knew that there was a scene on ladders because I'd seen still pictures of it, and I knew that there was a character of a stage manager that sort of talked to the audience. That's the most I knew about it. Yeah. But I got it. I get the French version, that is the Samuel French published version. I read it, and uh, I had the same reaction as a, as a reader that the audiences had originally, and I, I loved it, and I said right away, yes, I'd love to do it. Yeah. And we did it last year, you see, in Mineola. Mm -hmm. We did front page in, in our town last year, and we were asked to bring our town into this anti invitational series that you saw. Yeah. I saw that original production. You saw the old mm -hmm. old production? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very beautiful. But then you're very correct in the way you were playing it because that's that's kind of a northeast version of a Greek chorus that's commenting right. on right. the whole yeah. thing going on. You can't get involved no, to that no. extent. You don't seem to have Makes a nerve stronger. in your body, do you? They don't show, Richard. Oh they're they're way <laughs> under there? Yeah. Do you you mean they're fun to butterflies? No Upside kidding. Down. I can't imagine Upside that. You seem to down. be the picture of, tra you could be a, a walking advertisement for uh, tranquilizers or something. <laughs> and I can't imagine that you, uh, do, do you get very nervous backstage opening night? Do you no, really uh, no, that's something else. See, this is not like theater at all for me. You mean this? I'm called a neurotic actor in the theater because I don't get nervous opening night when everybody else is uptight. Yeah. And I don't because I can hardly wait to get out there and be this person that a very funny writer, let's say, if I'm going to be yeah. the author and your critic and critic's choice or Mr. Roberts, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I've rehearsed it for four weeks and tried it out in Baltimore and ever, and I'm ready. I don't have to be nervous because I got a mask on that's been written for me and uh, I got great lines to say. I haven't, I, I'm, I'm stuttering true. here now because I got no author taking care of me. I'll write That's you something. <laughs> Stick with me, I'll write you something. Uh, have, have you seen Easy Rider? Yeah, four times, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it at four hours length, at three hours length, at two hours length, and at the version that you see now, which is a little over an hour and a half, I think. I, oh, were you involved I in said, the cutting well, of it? Or? I was not involved, except mm -hmm. as the father of the bride, I was asked to come to uh, yes. just see it, you know, and comment yeah. if I had a comment to make. My only comment was it ought to be shorter. Yeah. When it was Apparently. four hours long. Apparently they took good. I remember when but Jane... But it just got better and better, yeah. You're the only fond that we haven't had here now. Uh, Jane was here once. I remember the first interview she ever gave in which she said she did not want to cash in on your name, and I thought that was nice. Of course, she would have looked silly calling herself Henry Fonda, but um, <laughs> she... Uh, I guess they both felt that, that they, they uh, wanted to really make it uh, themselves. Did you read the papers that. today? No, what happened? You haven't read no, I she won the New York paper. Critics oh, Film Critics Award. Oh, bravo. I saw actress. that last night. Congratulations, yeah. Father. Yeah. It is. It's very. It's very exciting. She just arrived last night from London. Got mm -hmm. in about nine o'clock at night and was given the news as she stepped off the plane. And of course, it's been pretty hectic around the house all day because the phone hasn't stopped ringing with. That was for They Shoot Horses, don't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's marvelous. Mm -hmm. Let me be the last to congratulate her since <laughs> I didn't see the papers today. We will be back after this, you know what. Uh, Robert Shaw was here last night and he was talking about he was trying to perfect an accent for Elmer Gantry and he decided oh, yeah. that Nebraska was the right choice oh, really? for him. And I told him to Give him watch tonight and study uh, <laughs> the way you sound. Can you do foreign accents? Uh, I never see you play um, a Japanese, for I example, have, or no, an English. No, I haven't. Uh, 
I avoid it, as a matter of fact. Yeah. In, in your choice of roles, uh, you know, so many of your films have had um, kind of social import, uh, at least they were interpreted that way, Grapes of Wrath, of course, and all of uh, Is that why you chose them, or do you just no. choose the parts? I had an interview today, as a matter of fact, uh, about Peter, and the man interviewing me by phone was talking about relating Easy Rider to Grapes of Wrath and talked about what you just said, that I sort of have the uh, people expect me or think of me as a, as a man who has something to say. And I denied it. I said John Steinbeck had something to say and, uh, and Reggie Rose had something to say in, in Twelve Angry Men. But I'm just an actor who I think recognizes a good part when I read it and I love to play it. And if there's uh, something to be told, a message, it's not mine, it's, it's the author's. But it's the way you tell it. It has a great deal to do with it. Yeah. That does make well, the difference, uh, the delivery. That's fine. I just, I, I feel I would be taking credit for the author's thoughts no. if I said I had something to say, because mm. it's he's got. And I'm happy to be able to translate it, and if, it's, if he thinks it's the way it should be translated, I'm, I'm pleased that he's pleased. But, uh, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Excuse me, I'm not taking the uh, Shoot. What's the longest you've ever played in a single play? Roberts, I played it for four years, about 1,600 times. Now, about 900 times in, mm. what does it feel like to go through the, the same thing every, every night? Well, that was a special. I wouldn't be able to do it with, uh, I can't say, a point of no return I played for two years. Mm -hmm. I would have been That's... pretty tired after two years of point of no return. It wasn't that um, rewarding a part, let's say. Roberts, from the first to the end, and the last performance was not only as exciting, not just for me, for everybody in the cast, not only as exciting, but I think better, because we got better mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by a graph that didn't go this way, but very slow. In other words, it's so easy to become, to stop listening in the theater for an actor. You become automatic. The other actor's talking to you, and you can look at him, but you're thinking no. about where you're going to have supper that night that's instead right. of... And that's the first place that the actor can make a mistake. So you have to concentrate all the time to, to listen, to make your listening the first time as well as your speech the first time, because it's the first time for them, so you owe them you the never, illusion of the first time. You never find yourself winging it after uh, so many, no, no, so many no, times. Never. That's always been, a, a, to, the, to those of us who play as well, but if we had to play the same work, Mm -hmm. Night after night, we'd climb the walls sometimes because it's, it just becomes impossible. You begin to play by rote. I think in music there'd be more possibility of varying it a bit than there Varying would be it, if you the can't, not the work. same piece, uh. not the same work. It becomes a very difficult thing. And then you become the, gr that's the greatest crime in music, you become a bore. Mm -hmm. Because you, you yeah. play uninterestedly, you know. Is there anything worse than being on stage and forgetting a line? I, I've had some acting experience in Summerstock. And I don't know how you can learn to train yourself out of the fact that when you blow a line, you then blow the next four, it seems like. And that awful feeling of suddenly there's been a silence for eight and ten seconds, and then a chill hits you, and you oh. think, it's me. I'm the one that... Your eyes get glassy. And, and now another second has gone by, and now another one, and then you think, I wonder how many more seconds I can wait, and if I hold still, maybe they won't know it's me. And uh, so you look to another actor and try to blame him, and you go through an awful lot of very bad feelings, uh, and then you can't get it out of your head. Then you'll, you're liable to louse up the next few. Has this ever happened to you? It happened once, but worse than that, for me, it, in a long run, mm. if you let your mind go ahead, mm. and you yep. can, you can become, so you can say the things you've always said for 1,600 times, Except the law. and then suddenly you're thinking, I've got one, and out of context you can't say it, and suddenly you start to panic, I don't know the third line from now. You just oh. never, at least I must never, let myself go ahead of mm -hmm. what I'm saying at the moment. Especially if you go from the first act to the third and the audience goes home an hour after they get yeah. <laughs> theater. Yeah, once I did go up and um, our audience was almost as close as your audience here. Mm -hmm. We don't use footlights in the theater anymore, you know, and our right. stage went out. It was a little higher than that, but it was as close to their knees as it is here, and somebody one night put their white coat up onto the stage. Now this is our, our, this is our home, the stage. Yeah. It doesn't belong to them. They keep out there. Well, I'm standing, going, looking profile across the stage, and all I can see out of the corner of my eye is a great immense, it was this big, it was a big white. <laughs> That's all I could think of. And I went sky high. 
Yeah. Fortunately, there were other actors on the stage that could pick it up and keep it going until I could. But and I was so mad, I wanted to kick it right back into their lap, you know. But that's stepping out of character. That, that, you know? I, I don't think people in real life, they as opposed to what we do, thing. can explain or can understand how infuriating a thing like that could be. Take a program and put it up on the stage, you know, mm -hmm. if you're in the front row. That's just bad manners. Or if yeah. you're speaking a cadence line, or if you're playing in a yeah. tempo and the ladies have brought their little children, the little girl with the little white bobby socks, and she's doing oh. this in a different temple, oh, yes. right in front of your nose, you know? Oh. That you know, it just kills you when that happens. I think it would, or an old lady with a yo-yo would no, be a little annoying, too. This is, the, but I'll tell you what really happened to me. I was playing a concert in New Haven with the orchestra, and I was playing the Beethoven Violin Concerto, than which there is no other greater work written by man. Mm -hmm. And in the second movement, which literally takes off into the heavens, you close your and you just fly. In the front row, they don't have a real stage there in the hall. It's, there's a lectern. The orchestra sits on the, on the, on the stage there, the, the main, main hall where they have, they have addresses and so forth. And right in the first row, there's an old lady sitting there. Lit, this is completely true, I swear. Wearing, well, you might call it a hat. It covered her head and various things came out of it. And she was wearing parts of about four sweaters and two unmatched boots, you know, very, very odd. Well, she was a local color. Mm -hmm. And she was sitting right in the first row, right on my nose. We were playing away. Paul Hindemith, the conductor, was conducting. We were playing away. She reached down to a shopping bag in the middle of this seraphic <laughs> silence and pulls out a bag of, of popcorn and starts eating it right in the middle of the concert. Oh. No, this is the time yes. when, 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 you, when you don't know where to look and you don't know how to keep from screaming. That happens. Yeah. It's, it's yes. one of the frightening things that can happen. What city stage. was that in? This was in the center of our culture called Yale. That was in New Haven? At Yale University, New Haven. She, oh. was not, she was not a member of the student body. Uh -oh. Now, today, today she might have been. <laughs> I see. Today she might have been. She was dressed like some well, kids dress today. But uh, We're so ashamed of Aunt Edna. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we'll be back after this. Stay there. Gentlemen, the nation is listening to us. Oh, excuse us. <laughs> We're talking about the noise and the no. decibel level of our, of our society, musically. Uh, oh, I must introduce uh, a, a lady who's most interesting. I think if you, you have not met her, you will be glad to, and you will too. Uh, Charlotte Curtis is her name. She, some not too many years ago, or maybe only a couple of years ago, took over the um, society page of the New York Times, uh, a part of the paper that I have always read for amusement. And uh, since she uh, has taken it over, it has become considerably more amusing. She has a sort of way about looking at certain posh events that she attends. Uh, that make them much more entertaining to the uh, average reader and sometimes a bit upsetting to those who uh, appeared at the events. But be that as it may, uh, Charlotte Curtis has made the woman's page of the time something to turn to uh, among the first things you look at. Will you welcome, please, Charlotte Curtis. <laughs> Mr. Fonda, Mr. Stern, I believe you probably... Gentlemen. Uh, when is the death of society uh, going to take place? Cleveland Amory has been talking about it for some time, and a lot of us want to know when to send flowers. Um, th I there's wish always I knew. talking about society dying. Uh, is it ill? Um, it may be ill, but it's not dying yet, I'm afraid. It's not. No, it keeps going on. Yeah. But it's in revolution, so there's hope. One way or another, yeah. Uh, we'll... Um, you were at, I think it was in today's paper I saw. I did see today's paper. Of course I did. Uh, the debutante ball that you covered for last night. Um, and I have never exactly understood the function of the debutante in our society. I'm and not in, sure that the debutante knows the function anymore. You know they come out and they meet their mothers and fathers and they are presented to their mothers and fathers and their mothers and fathers' friends that they have known since all the time they were growing up and they meet each other. I really don't understand what presentation means in 1969. To come out refers to coming out from where into what? Well, that's what they used to do. I mean, they came mm -hmm. out from behind the scenes, so to speak, mm -hmm. in days past into uh, what passed for polite society. 
uh, today, they seem to be here all along. Um, I mean, certainly the younger generation is here all along. They know more than we do. Why would they need to be presented to us in such a formal occasion? I was hoping you could answer that. I really have never known. I've never been invited to a debutante party. Do you think I would have any? Well, you missed fun? a very good one last night. You know, they had a lot of American flags. And they had... I'm relieved to hear that. No, I didn't no, it know was, that. It was very interesting, as debuts go, you see. I mean, I always thought of it as kind of a party where um, everything was white and elegant and so on. And the theme of this was pink for femininity. They said it, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Silver for elegance. And then there was all the setting with the girls in the white dresses. But all the decorations had some kind of flags involved with them and military escorts. And the first debutante was introduced to something like, I'm sure it was the Stars and Stripes Forever. <laughs> and Maureen Finch, who is the daughter of the Health, Education, and Welfare Secretary, when she was introduced, they played America the Beautiful while she was curtsying. It's hard to be dainty to America the Beautiful, isn't it? It's better than curtsying to the Stars and Stripes Forever, though, I expect. She, but this was all like that. And then there was a replica of a moon, it was called a moon above the stage that made of little mirrors that was supposed to go around like this. And then there would be sp spatters of light all over everywhere. But it looked like the moon as in the orbit with the, I think that's what the flag was doing on it. Uh, yes. Also flowers, that made it like a debutante. It's not a moon without flowers. Um, that's very strange. Now, now are the people, that, like excuse that. me, go ahead. Who decides who, yeah, who, who decoration who, that they're gonna be flags? What's, well, the, the planners of any ball decide everything. Um, this is the international ball, so naturally there would be a lot of American flags. <laughs> but there were other flags. Good. I mean, they did have other countries, and when they mm -hmm. came to the dessert, it was sort of a little ice cream tort, and then it had little greases and little turkeys and things stuck in it. So you would know that it was international. And at least 14 of the debutantes out of 62 were from abroad, mm -hmm. and the English girl got into terrible trouble because she wore a see-through dress with pants, and the ball committee complained. They said they weren't ready for pants. But she did. What, what? She had to change her dress. So she put on a lace dress under the coat that had gone over the pants. So that you could still... See through? Or well, not? sort of semi see through. I see. Well, if you keep than... moving, you never see through a see through, you know. If I keep moving, I see through it. Uh, we. <laughs> what is that, station break? Okay, we must break a station, whatever that means, and then we'll be back. <laughs> Four of us, pillars of society, discussing society itself. Uh, Charlotte, may I call you that? Oh, I've please. met you four times now, and, and you may call me Mr. Cavett. <laughs> uh, are there, you've moved among the rich now a lot in the line of work, and I wonder if you've come across any disadvantages to being rich. Did you ever feel sorry for them in any way? I'm not sure they have a lot of fun all the time. Mm -hmm. They're so satiated with so many things that I'm not sure that things that make other people either happy or capable of having fun, um, get to them anymore. Yeah. Arrogance is terribly easily learned, and so is a quality of blaséness. Yeah. Um, after you've seen everything and done everything and had everything, um, what do you do then to get some kind of stimulation in life or to keep going, to get up in the morning? That's my problem. <laughs> I was wondering, though, really, what they do do. Uh, now, you see these charity balls, which presumably uh, are a, a function of society doing some good because the money goes to, to charity. Is that really how they work, and do they, can they get any satisfaction from that? Uh, well, they do, in fact, seem to get satisfaction, or they wouldn't continue to do it, and there's no mm -hmm. question that it goes on and on and on and on. There is undoubtedly some value to it, but uh, if everyone sat down and wrote a check, Mm -hmm. Instead of going through all this business of writing the check and getting the dinner and the entertainment and the dancing and the dresses and buying the tiara special for the evening, um, if they didn't do this kind of thing, more of the total money would go to the charity, obviously. But the question, of course, is that uh, the money would not get 
raised that way. Mm -hmm. Fundraisers are always saying you have to throw some confetti, if you will, symbolic. You have to do something to yeah. get people to contribute. It's very unfortunate. I would think that being exposed to society all the time, the one thing that would be on your mind a lot would be when we pick up the paper every day and read the, the problems in the ghettos and the fact that there isn't enough money for cancer research and all, that these affairs would take on a rather grisly aspect when you think of all of the money that is down the drain in caviar and champagne and uh, orange Julius's and whatever uh, is served. Um, would, would you be for a directer use of the money toward... Uh... Sure. Well, I can't help but see the comparisons, too. I mean, for example, um, and it's unfortunate that we're singling out an event that took place last night when it could have been one of a thousand events, mm -hmm. but um, that one last night, some of the parents contributed a thousand dollars apiece for the privilege of having this child presented in this splendor with these American flags. Uh, that thousand dollars written as a straight check for 62 girls is sixty-two thousand uh, dollars. I can think of any number of projects in Harlem right this moment on the Upper West Side in daycare centers, uh, on the Lower East Side, uh, the breakfast program of the Panthers. It is, after all, a bre breakfast program for small children who don't have breakfast otherwise. I can think of all kinds of things where this money could have been used um, that I think probably would have been more worthwhile. But by the same token, these people have a right to spend their money any way they choose. And uh, something like $50,000 was raised last night for the Soldiers and Sailors and Airmen's Club, which does make it possible for uh, servicemen to have some kind of entertainment in New York that's less expensive than it would be otherwise. Let me ask you one other thing, too. Is, this, is there a, just a fascination in, in making uh, money that doesn't have anything to do with uh, what you do after you get it? Do you find that, uh, I've always suspected there would be a boredom on the part of many people who are extremely wealthy in that they've had the fun once they get the money, but that uh, they don't seem to use it to take the vacations that one might take if one had that money or do the things that uh, somebody else might think of as pleasant. Uh, it's like the fun is in the act of getting. Um, well, the tycoon mystique. I mean, most American tycoons, really first-class tycoons, who've made the money themselves. Uh, these are all self-made men that I'm thinking of now. Nobody inherited anything. Uh, these people really love what they do so much to the point that they don't want to do anything else, whether it's mm -hmm. playing a corporate game if they had their own companies um, or if it's running an empire in some fashion. They'd rather, this is an avocation as well as a vocation, and the money, after you've got it to pay the bills and can make the life comfortable and therefore enjoy doing the work, um, it's pure fun for them. I mean, when they make a killing, they're exciting about the killing, not because of the, of the money that was raised in it necessarily, but because of the, I won. It's as though they just won a football game or, a, or some other form of contest. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a... Pause for a moment. Before we do, I want to ask you one thing that was on another page of the, your section of the paper today. There was an article about the women who were protesting the selling of um, the furs of the animals who were nearly extinct, the spotted furs, which is a favorite uh, subject of mine. And it said near the end of the article that Mrs. Onassis, Jackie or Jacqueline Onassis, is sore uh, because they're trying to get her to give up her Somali leopard coat. W what is she sore about? Do you know uh, why she is? Well, I don't know that she is or that she isn't, even though I, too, read the New York Times and saw that today. <laughs> but uh, the, point, the point about this is that when, when somebody like Jacqueline Kennedy buys a Somali leopard coat, and at the same time she bought it, I might add, Elizabeth Taylor bought one, too. And they appeared in opposite ends of the world wearing these beautiful things. Then everybody seemed to have to want one, too, whether they got the real thing or the um, uh, plastic or man-made furs. Beside the point, mm -hmm. this created a run on Somali leopards. A run on Somali leopards could put all Somali leopards out of business. Yeah, there aren't many left now. Yeah. Which is why um, there's a problem here. Now, presumably, if Mrs. Kennedy's angry, it would be because she's tired of people, first off, copying her Somali leopard coat, mm -hmm. and number two, uh, harassing her 
about her taste. Yeah. Well, I wish she'd snap out of it. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll be back after this. <laughs> Mr. Fonda has an engagement. Uh, I promise to let you go at a certain point. I wanted to ask you one thing, though. I've I was thinking you in War and Peace, walking among all the bombs going off and, and drums along the Mohawk, everyone was... Uh, have you ever been hurt making a film? Oh, yes. Have you? Oh, yes. How? I don't mean emotionally hurt. I mean, <laughs> really. You mean... Really? Tell you the story of... Well, yeah. in uh, Battle of the Bulge is an example. We were charging through a... Uh, rubble street with bombs burst, supposed to be bursting and what they were were charges that were put there yeah. and one was supposed to burst there and I had to fall. I was carrying a rifle and when I fell there was a projection on the side of the barrel of the rifle that sticks out as big as your thumb mm -hmm. and I fell on it and it went right into my hand and put a hole in my hand as big as my thumb and it <laughs> happened so fast that I didn't have any feeling. I just got up and I saw it and it didn't hurt, but I saw a hole in my hand. <laughs> Not exactly where you want one, is no. it? Is there an Academy Purple Heart or anything? <laughs> uh, oh, gee, I, that's, um, uh, I, I, don't know if, I worry about the people in those battles. I worry all the it? time. 35 years ago, I was doing one called Jesse James, and uh, we were on horseback, ready for the scene to start, and on, the, on action, we were supposed to rear our horses and charge shooting in the air. Of course, we had blanks in our guns, mm -hmm. and we get all ready, and so I cock the gun, and it's up there, but then something happens, and they don't, aren't quite ready, so I take it off cock and let it down, you know, and then finally they're all ready to get it up there again, and again, it doesn't start. This time, I lowered it, because it's just heavy to hang up there, hold up there for five minutes. I let it down without taking the cock off, and my horse just went like that, and went boom! Just took Ooh. the whole side of my wardrobe down. I had powder burns that had to send me to the hospital in Kansas City for tetanus shots. You ever thought of being an ice man or anything? Yes, like that? a lot, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I really want to thank you for being here thank tonight. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, and uh, please don't punch holes in yourself. You, you believe it's Henry Fonda when he walks out, that great Fonda walk. I wonder if he knows that he does Henry Fonda's walk so well. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, I have backed us up a little bit. We have a most interesting thing coming on the show next. This is the gentleman uh, that I told you about, about whom uh, a Broadway play has been written. And um, my next guest is blind. So we will go back for a moment to uh, the stations, and then we will come back and you'll see us. One of the uh, big comedy hits on Broadway is a play called Butterflies Are Free, and the play's unusual because the hero of the play is blind. Uh, Keir DeLay plays the gentleman on Broadway, and we have learned that the uh, play is based on an actual person who is sitting to my right. His name is Harold Krentz, and I apologize to you. Your name is spelled wrong at the beginning of our show. Um, I wouldn't have even known. <laughs> true now that you mention it. It's not unusual. We've spelled Bob Hope's name wrong here. That's very hard to believe, I've I know. I've always wanted some of those movies, especially, you know, some of those rather wild physical movies with Braille subtitles, but... Uh... <laughs> I was about... That is a disadvantage. It sure I is. I never thought of that. Terrible. You know there aren't any dirty books in Braille. This is a... It's a horrible situation. <laughs> oh, wait. wait. Seri seriously, Dick, Maybe. as far as we're concerned, kids are delivered by Braille storks. It's a horrible situation. Charlotte, could we arrange a ball for Braille pornography? Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe Absolutely. Th there's something that, that we so could do. Well. Were, you, were you blind from birth? Yeah, I uh, was born with, uh, I was born two and a half months premature. I just snuck in under the wire. Mm -hmm. And uh, near the end of the Second World War, it happened to a lot of kids. They put too much oxygen in the incubator. And um, a lot of kids became blind, and a lot of kids became mentally retarded. Uh, there are those who know me who claim that I got the best of both worlds, but I, I choose to deny it. Uh, yeah. And then my left eye improved until I was nine, and um, my retina detached in my left eye at that point. And um, 
a retina operation is pretty much of a one-shot deal. Either it sticks or it didn't. Yeah. And mine didn't. Can you remember what it was like to see? I can remember color very well. Yeah. Uh, but it's amazing how little you look around you before uh, when you're that young. You know, you'd figure mm -hmm. by nine years old, you'd tend to look around. But uh, you don't tend to very much. And uh, it's really unfortunate. I think there's one of my great peeves with people who can see, and I, I guess this goes for all of the uh, various senses, that people don't take advantage of them, that they don't look around. Uh, I wish that everybody would consider their eyes as something that uh, is very precious, maybe to look around you as if the next day you won't be able to see. And I think mm -hmm. people would get so much more out of, uh, out of the world and out of life. Yeah. Uh, the, but I have a blast anyhow. I have a good the, time. The character in the play is remarkably uh, free of, of self-pity, um, something we were talking about earlier on the part of actors. Um, is it hard to get past the stage of feeling sorry for yourself? I know I would. Oh, I don't at all. As a matter of fact, I have a lot of fun. You have to realize, though, that a lot of sighted people have a, a lot of stereotypes about the blind, mm -hmm. and they can do some uh, pretty foolish things. Uh, and you can become very bitter and obviously very sorry for yourself as well. I tend to uh, find the humor in a situation. Can I give you an example? Yes. Well, We, we welcome humor. Okay. Uh, for example, um, there's a tendency among a lot of sighted people to assume that if you can't see, you also can't talk. Uh, so that invariably when I'll go out uh, for dinner, the waitress will say, uh, would he like some potatoes to my date? Would he like some potatoes? Oh, yeah, I say, oh, yeah, he would. Yep. <laughs> well, one day when I was um, at Harvard, I went to Harvard College, uh, and I was in one of the uh, houses in which we lived, and the food was served in a cafeteria-type style situation. The ladies would put our food on the trays, and invariably, for about three months, they'd say, uh, would he like some onions? And I said, yeah. Would it like some dessert? Yep, yep, it sure would. Well, <laughs> after about two and a half months of this, um, I felt it was time to retaliate. And as I say, you can become bitter. I found it rather humorous. So one night, when all of the various house members had their dates, and the dining room was packed. We started down the line, I and my roommate, and this poor woman said, Ha, ah, would he be liking some onions? So I winked over at my roommate, and he said, Hold on, I'll ask him. And he went, Hungawa, Hunyawa, Sawa, Kinga, Chinga, Sawa, Chinga, Hawanyawa, Kawa, Hunga. To which I replied, Gawa, Hunga, Gawa, Singa. I started ripping off my shirt and jumping up on the counter. Gawa, Chinga, Sanga, Chunga, Haya, Hunga, Hinga. So my roommate finally said, yeah, Yes, he would. <laughs> We had no more trouble for the rest of the three years I was in the house. That's a bit strenuous having to do that each time. It was rough. It was We're, rough. I heard that you were classified through uh, the unerring skill of bureaucracy as 1A in the draft. Uh, <laughs> is, this, is this true? Yeah, it's a very funny story. Uh, when I turned 18, as any red-blooded American male, I registered with the draft, I expected they'd reclassify me 4F, however, uh, because of my physical handicap. But my draft board, showing their great liberality, <laughs> yes. reclassified me 2S, which is a student deferment. So throughout my four years at Harvard, I'd drag out my draft card at parties and say, hey, look who'll be defending you, and we'd all get a big kick out of it. Well, my first year at Harvard Law School, near the end of the year, I called up home one day um, we have all our finals at the end of the year, so I was a bit tense. And I called up and I said, well, Mom, how's the Braille going? And she said, son, we're terribly upset. I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Mom. What's the matter? She said, son, they need you. <laughs> I said, well, the way my studying was going at that point, Dick, anybody who needed me was fine with me. So I said, Mom, who needs me? She said, your country needs you, son. I said, let me talk to Dad, Mom. I... She said, he's been weeping all day. <laughs> so finally, um, I said, Mom, what are you talking about? She said, well, you've been reclassified 1A. I said, Mom, we must be losing the war. <laughs> I said, I know Johnson said if anybody who could carry a gun, but isn't he taking this rather literally? Yes. So I, um, the next thing, the draft board refused to back down. They said, we don't care if he's blind or not. He's got 30 days to appeal. So <laughs> I said I'd be more than happy to go as long as they may be a bombardier. That was my only... <laughs> don't laugh. Could you just see me lying in the trenches, firing away? Private Krentz, Private Krentz, you just shot another general. Well, that's great, guys. Yeah, but that was Creighton Abrams. Well, if you guys don't aim me better, what the heck do you expect? 
<laughs> it's a, it is a strange thing. Uh, how, how do you manage to, uh, to study, though? That, that, there, I have uh, between 20 and 30 really good-looking girls who read two hours a week to me. It's a great deal. They read, all of the other guys yeah. in the hall have been feigning blindness all year. But, uh. <laughs> see that. Uh, is it true you can play football? Yeah, we play every weekend. Uh, right after I went blind completely, my brother uh, felt very strongly that he wanted to have a uh, brother who could play football with him. So he, I used to run out 15 yards and he'd throw the football at me and uh, if I squinched my face, yeah, thanks. I guess uh, I don't need to tell you that someone is playing us off. Wait a minute, we'll be back after this message. Wait a minute. Carol, uh, due to uh, a snafu, we have run out of time. Uh, I thought we had a whole other segment left. So uh, I know there was a song you were going to do for us, but I don't want to tip it. So maybe you can come back sometime. Gee, I'd love to, Dick. I'd okay. really like to sing it. In All any right. event, well, go on. I'm yeah. not going to take your time. OK, we only have 30 seconds of it, but you're welcome to it. But we will be back tomorrow night. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Mr. Stern. Thank you, Henry Fonda. And tomorrow night, uh, Betty Davis will be here. I assume it's the Betty Davis. And uh, a gentleman named Buck Henry, Pat McCormick, uh, Jonathan Miller. It's New Year's Eve tomorrow night, isn't it? That means if you're a New Yorker, any day now you get a very ugly calendar from your garage, New Year's. <laughs> it's about this time. We will be back tomorrow night with, yes, Betty Davis and all those people, and thank you, and we'll see you then. Sorry we ran out of time.